Amen. The land of cloudless day. Turn the book of 2 Peter with me tonight, please. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 4. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter number one and verse number four. The apostle says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy righteous name. In thy righteous name. Amen. If you notice, the Apostle Peter is telling you the virtues that make you mature. Yes. They mature you. Because when he says to give diligence, add to your faith, that's the beginning. That's how you start with faith. Add to that virtue. Virtue simply means the graces of the grace of God that add to your faith. And then to virtue knowledge, learn. But you learn the right way. Don't get puffed up because a lot of folks get puffed up. They become six-month wonders or a year. They're the most spiritual person in your church, thinking that they can judge everyone, and they don't have a clue what they're talking about. And then he says, and to knowledge temperance. And temperance has to do with the fact that you are beginning to gain wisdom from God. To know how to deal with an issue, that's an issue, a sin that is a sin, but how do you deal with it? How do you help the brother or the sister? And temperance, patience. You can't force people to do anything. You don't force the ministry. You don't drive people. You lead them. And so you have patience and then patience, godliness. Godliness has to do with when Christ is working his, his, his Christ be formed in you, the scripture calls it, it says. And then godliness, brotherly kindness. If you notice now, that becomes personal. Brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness, charity. In charity, there's nothing greater than charity. That's the greatest of all, 1 Corinthians 13. Nothing, charity never faileth. So what we're dealing with here is the fact that you are a mature Christian and you're learning how to deal with other Christians and you want to help them. And you know what it takes to help them. And it's not a matter of, uh, it's not a matter so much of knowledge, it's a matter of spiritual attainment. Spirit world, walking in the spirit. And I mentioned this morning, what is the essence of sin? Well, you can start with this. The essence of sin is spiritual. Yes. It's spiritual. Yes, it is. It's spiritual. And so we read here that if you have cannot see afar off, if these things are lacking in your life, you're not growing in the Lord, you're not maturing in God, but you have become a, you have become a, a God's policeman. Some think they are, and some think they can judge everything and everybody. And you have forgotten that you were purged from your old sin. Let me tell you tonight, I got some of that in me. How about you? Never make, never, ever, 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 ever put any confidence in your flesh. Don't ever do it. Because I can, you'll be certain to fail if you do. Now the flesh lusteth against the spirit. And they're incompatible. They are totally and completely incompatible. The flesh is the enemy of the spirit. And so he hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Yes. And as I've said to you before, can you go back tonight to the place where you came face to face with God? Can you remember it? Can you remember the place and the time? I can. I can take you right to the spot 
where I met the Lord. I can take you there. And I can remember the fact that what I used to be still resides in all this old flesh. Yes, all of that I used to be is still in this flesh. He didn't save the flesh. He saved my soul and my spirit was born again. You got to keep that in mind. So let me ask you tonight, are you willing to confess to God that he just read your, he read you a riot act? That every one of us fall, every one of us fall victim to what he's talking about. No confidence in the flesh. Did you forget how tempting the world is? Are you that one? Demas in 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Have you forgotten? Or do you still love the present world? Is it still a bigger part of your life than you think it should be? We all have that in us. Every one of us think about the, think about the things. And the, the Bible says sin at the pleasure for a season. And you have to understand that you crucify these things in the flesh. You put them to death. Live perfect? You're not going to live perfect. But you live within the will of God. Yes. What are you watching on television? What are you listening to on the radio? Amen. What crowd are you going with? Amen. What kind of life are you living? Yeah. You think that by living all week long with uh, your in the world and come to church on Sunday and hear a good song, shout and scream, and, and then you've had some kind of a great spiritual experience with God. It doesn't work that way. You grow in these things. Revival, as I said to you this morning, is something that's personal and it's what God does in your life. He does it for you. Do you want that? You remember that there is within me a Demas. Oh, he's alive and well within me. Demas lives within me. Does he live within you? Uh, are you so proud that you can't confess that tonight? All of these characters are alive in us in one form or another, to one degree or another. I can find myself in the Bible a thousand different places. Yes, sir, I can. Preachers, preach against the very thing they fall for. If you, talk, if you log on to YouTube and look at some of the preachers on there that are preaching about, uh, about adultery, and preaching about fornication, young girls, young children, and yet the very thing that they're preaching against, they fall prey to. They get intoxicated with power. It goes to their head, not their heart. They're intoxicated with it. They feel like they have this special relationship with God where they, God overlooks this because he's such a, he's such a champion, he's such a tool, he's, he's so needed. God doesn't need a one of us, but we need him. <laughs> oh my, come down off your high horse. What are you preaching? What kind of life are you living? You can be certain of this. Your sin will find you out. Yes, it will. It'll find you out. It'll find you out. Do you want your family to have to go through something like that? You look at these preachers, and I'm not running them down the sense to do that. I'm trying to use them as an illustration. Think of what they put their family through. Their wives, their children. Yeah. Think of it. Think of the hurt, the sorrow, the heartache, and the pain. And some of this lasts for a lifetime. And nothing changes. Think about it. I know one preacher that pastored one of the biggest churches you've ever seen went to prison. He went to prison for years. He went to prison for years. And maybe, 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 maybe God Almighty will be able to reach a few souls and get their eyes off of preachers and put them on the Lord. Yeah. Amen. 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 You forget how tempting the world is. And man, can it ever tempt you. Did you forget how truly weak we really are? Luke chapter 22 verse 54 says, Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest house. And Peter followed afar off. Afar off. You haven't given up your faith in Christ. You really haven't what you say, turn your back on the Lord, but you're not up there in fellowship with him. No. Let me tell you something too that I just read about this man, Peter. I couldn't carry his shoes off the floor. Right. He's a thousand Amen. times the man that I am. He's an apostle of God. Amen. Amen. Yes. He can write scripture, yes. but he followed him afar off. Why? Because he got caught in the flesh. Right. He, really, he, he learned something about himself he really didn't know. 
And until he learned something about himself, he really didn't know it wasn't, he could never get to the place with God that he could get later. Once you learn it, once you realize, then God can do something with you. Put no confidence in the flesh. Did you forget how hard the ministry is? I'm talking to preachers tonight now and pastors. Jeremiah chapter number 20, verse 7, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me. And a derision daily. A preacher lives in a pressure cooker and a fishbowl. Yep. All of them do, especially a pastor. Right. He lives in a pressure cooker and a fishbowl. Most people wouldn't want to live like that. And what I say to you tonight, it's not for your pity, it's for your prayers. Yes. Preaching, pastoring a church is hard business. That's right. It's hard, very hard. And it's just as hard on the pastor's wife as it is the pastor. Amen. Since I've been in this church, I have seen more than one preacher with his family busted up. One woman ran off with another man and left him with the children. Right here. Yeah. We're talking about 40 years ago. Another one left. Another one left. And when these, a lot of times a preacher gets into the ministry, takes a church and begins to pastor it, the wife is totally unprepared for what she's about to face. That's right. And that's what happens. Yeah. You ought to pray for your, pe your preachers and your pastors and your evangelists. So let me say to you, young man, tonight, if you're listening, if you're watching me, and, you're, and, you, and you have any respect for what I have to say, if God's called you, he called you. Number one. He called you, he called you. And the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I don't know of a thing tonight that I could go do that's greater than what I'm doing because of the call of God on my life. It's not a job, it's a call. It's a call. God called me to do this. Did he call you to preach? Well, then preach. But just because he called you to preach doesn't mean he called you to pastor. You have, many, you have many ministries in the word, in the, in the church. You have a pastor. You have an evangelist. You've got missionaries. You have, you, have, you have all of these that build up and make part of the body of Christ. Find your place. Find your place. Find your calling. Make your calling and election sure. Find out. God doesn't always deal with people like he does me. He knew how, he knew how stubborn and hard-headed and, and uh, could not. I hadn't been saved but three years and he stuck me in the middle of a dog fight uh -huh. pastoring a church. Dog fight preacher, you better believe it. Yeah. When I came to Temple Baptist Church, we had people who wouldn't talk to each other. Yeah. People who wouldn't talk, they wouldn't look at each other. Yet they expected to have good services. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And you see, I didn't know any better. I didn't know anything. I just knew I was saved. So what'd you do, preacher? I just opened the Bible, read it back and preached and <laughs> let it fall where it falls and let it do what it's going to do and then learn and then learn. I've made a lot of mistakes, folks. I've made a lot of mistakes. I look back at some of the things. I wish I could change them. I feel bad about it. There's nothing I can do about it. I had no mentor. There's nobody that could, and I guess God meant it to be that way. I had no mentor, I had nobody to turn to. I had to learn it and learn it from God and learn it. And in 46 years now, 46 years pastoring a church, I've learned a few things. You know what I've learned? I've learned to help each other. I've learned when one of you begin to struggle, don't kick them down, kick them out. Pray for them. Go to them. Try to assist them. Amen. Don't try to judge everything about their lives and, and set yourself up as some kind of a magistrate in their life. Pray for them. Let God do the judging. He's the only one qualified that can do that. And when you see one of your brothers or sisters, you see them failing and falling and, and drifting away, why, pray for them. Prayer is a powerful thing. And then make yourself a friend to them. Show them you care for them. Be there for them. Show them brotherly kindness godly brotherly kindness and show them the grace of God show them the charity that God gave you show it to them go out of your way to show it to them but you don't have to judge them God will take care of the judging that's one of the things I've learned 
I've also learned the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So don't you forget how truly weak you are. Peter followed afar off. And Jeremiah said, Lord, I've been deceived. I'm in derision daily. Somebody told me in Bible college that pastoring wouldn't be like this. No man can tell you what pastoring is from a book. You have to go do it. <laughs> A lot of professors out here in Bible colleges don't have a clue what it is to pastor a church. Believe me, they don't have a clue. Not unless they are a veteran and they've pastored, then they know. And so have you fallen into greed? What is greed? Greed's a tendency to selfish craving, grasping, and hoarding. It's defined as a selfish or excessive desire for more than is needed or deserved, especially of money, wealth, food, or other possessions. Yeah. I got some greed in me. Yeah. I have to, I, yeah, I got greed in me. Why, yeah, you treasure, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just like you have. That's right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, let's just, let's just be honest with each other. <laughs> sure you do. We all do. The reason you do is because you're in the flesh. And until we leave this body, we're going to have to deal with that issue. That's the old man. And the old man doesn't like to turn loose. I know a prosperity preacher that has his own private airport. He lives in a mansion. I mean, you wouldn't believe. And they say he's worth between 500 and $700 million. And he's a prosperity preacher. Do you know what a $1,000 million is? That's a billion with a B. He's about $300 million away from being a billionaire. Preaching the gospel. The Lord Jesus said, The Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. Amen. Foxes have their holes, so forth. He had, to, he had to get a fish to come up, pay his taxes. I wonder how genuine that, <laughs> that, that coin was that he got out of the mouth of that fish. Amen. I mean, I hope that wasn't a counterfeit coin. He paid his taxes with it. God's been good to me, folks. I've got a nice home, got a car. I've got transportation, got food, not starving to death, got clothes, Amen. breathing. I'm yes. breathing tonight. Amen. I'm thankful. Yes. The longer you live, the more you can be thankful for breathing. <laughs> like Brother Ed Blue said, I found out it was important to breathe. Yeah, but it is important. If you ever let yourself get in a shape where you can't breathe, you'll understand. I was there 10 years ago. I know what heart failure is. And I'm gasping for breath and can't get a deep breath. But tonight I breathe. I thank God for it. The greed. You ever heard of Gehazi? Yes. Yes. Gehazi. Gehazi, he was the servant of Elisha. He was a good man. We read about Gehazi in the Bible. He's a good man. And Elisha, God used to heal Naaman of his leprosy. Naaman. He said, you go, you go dip in the Jordan River. He said, we have far, far in a banner here. What are you talking about, Jordan? That's nothing but a mud puddle compared to these rivers. You go dip in the Jordan. And he did. God healed him. And he was happy about it. I mean, he was thankful. He really was. He wanted to give that prophet money. Prophet said, no, don't you money. This is free. We don't sell the things of God. Amen. And I still believe that. To this very day, you listen to the radio broadcast. If you want this tape, write in and get it. If you've got an offering, fine. You don't have an offering, you'll still get the tape. And I still believe that. You don't make the word of God. You don't charge people for the no. Bible. No. no, 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 no. But do you know what happened to Gehazi? Naaman was a rich man. He was wealthy. He saw an opportunity. He saw an opportunity to enrich himself. And you know what he did? He seized it. You know what happened to him? He was smitten with leprosy, not only Gehazi, but his whole family. I mean, his posterity, the future. Lepers, he said, left white in leprosy. Like you, all of a sudden he's smitten with leprosy. Why? Greed. I got greed in me. I have to get on my face every once in a while and say, Lord, now get my eyes off of that. Get my eyes off of that. I don't have to have that. I don't need that. Yeah, amen. amen. Some of you look at me with shock. Like you, <laughs> you mean to tell me our pastor has, has greed? Oh, yeah. Oh, 
Look at this one. What about lust? You see, the generation today, culture today, lust, L-O-V-E. They call it love. You ever notice how they use the word love to support sodomy, to support everything in the sun with love, love, love. And they don't have a clue what the word means. If you're not willing to die for somebody, you don't really love them. The Apostle John said that. He said, in this is manifest the love of God that you lay down your life for your brethren. Christ loved us and gave himself for us. That's real love. That's what builds families. That's what builds families. You fight for your family. You fight for your husband. Fight for your wife. The man's responsibility is to fight for his wife. Fight for his home. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. That's what makes a home. That's what women look for protection. They want protection. They want, they want, they want security. Where are you going to get it? You're not going to get it from a, you're not going to get it from a, an it that doesn't know if it's a, a male or female. Lord have mercy. <laughs> These kids in school now, I mean, the minute they get in there, little old kids like this. Well, what are you? What do you identify as today? Well, this and that and all that kind of garbage. They're pumping. Who, who, who are these self-appointed social engineers? They, th they can't even educate your kids. And yet, they're, and yet they're messing with their identity, with their sexual identity. They can't even educate them. My, what a thing. Like I say again, if I run for office to destroy the public school system, how many vote for me? I'd do away with it in a heartbeat. It's over. <laughs> Finished. Well, how would you educate them like they used to? Homeschooling, churches can educate them. Yeah. Community get together and build their own school. All yeah. kinds of ways to educate yeah. kids. Absolutely. And you can do it. But Gehazi, Samson, Judges 16, 16, it came to pass she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Yeah. He told her all his heart and she knew it. Yeah. Delilah knew it. Lust, preacher, that's what Samson was Listen, Samson was a judge in the book of Judges. Okay, when, the, when people did that, which was right in their own eyes. And Samson was the most fleshly of all the judges. Yes, he was, and he paid dearly for it. But he was fleshly. He fleshly. But you know what he did? He, got, he let her cut his hair. And then she cried, Samson, the Philistines are on ye, upon thee. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. Yeah. But he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. That's one of the most ironic things in all the Bible. I'll go shake myself. But you've already broken your vow. There's no, you, your fellowship with God's gone. That long hair was a sign of a Nazarene. It's a Nazarene vow, Nazarite vow. It was taken. Don't shut, you don't cut that hair. And yet he'd broken it. Did you know a lot of times people go out and shake themselves? A lot of preachers shake themselves. Yeah. And wish not that the anointing is gone. Are you messing around? Lust resides in every last one of us. And if you're watching the wrong thing on TV, you won't stop with TV. It'll lead you somewhere else. How many of you agree with what I'm saying tonight? Don't play with fire, you get burned. Don't mess with it. Leave it alone. Well, I've sanctified my flesh. No, you haven't. <laughs> that in itself is a statement that you haven't because you're full of yourself and you're full of pride. Now, this one here is how about rebellion? Absalom in 2 Samuel 15, 13, came a messenger to David and said, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. He stood at the gate. He wanted power. He wanted to take the kingdom from his father. And he told them at the gate, he said, now, your David did this, but I would do this. Yeah. And he was beautiful, the Bible said. He had this long hair. Yeah. He had charisma. People loved him. My, what, what a man Absalom was. Abba Shalom is his name in Hebrew. Abba, Father Shalom of peace. Absalom, Father of peace. You know what he is? He's a type of the Antichrist in the fact that he rebels against David who's a type of Christ. And of course, we know what happened. He had his long hair, gloried in his long hair, and his glory cost him his life. For his long hair got caught in the oak tree. There he hung, and he had enemies. 
and one of them was Joab. Most of us will make enemies in a lifetime. If, if, listen, if, 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 you're, if you are so sensitive that you think that you're going to have everybody like you, <laughs> I hate to tell you this tonight. Ain't happening. Uh-uh. Ain't happening. <laughs> I'm sure there's some folks out there that don't have better use for me. But you can ask my wife. I roll over and I put that CPAP on. Turn that machine on, and I roll over, and I'm gone on Never Never Land. So I hate to make you mad tonight. If you're one of those haters, you're not bothering me one bit. <laughs> How about you? I said, well, I'm preaching nobody to hate me. Ah, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> Some folks carry a grudge for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. Grudges, man. Grudges. Oh, yeah. He was a rebel. That means that every one of us have a degree of rebellion in us, right? The Bible said rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. It's a spiritual thing to rebel, to rebel against who? David, a type of Christ, to rebel against the Lord. Has he asked you to do something? You absolutely were not going to do it. Has he convicted you of something and you absolutely will not get down and confess it? Are you, trying, are, you, are you into something and you know God's, it's not God's will and you're not going to do it? You're not going to change it? You're not going to do anything about it? That's rebellion. Yes, it is. And it gives birth to all kinds of problems. You see, there's that interconnectedness of sin. There is no such thing as this one sin that abides alone. No, 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 no. no. They all come from the same source and they're connected. Yeah. Some are worse in degree. Yes, they are. Some have worse ramifications. Yes, they do. But they're still of the same source. Sure. It's a spiritual thing. Yeah. And it gives birth to it. But let me introduce you tonight to somebody that I think you'll like him. I really do. I think you'll like him. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. I believe you'll like this man. I do. I really do. He's quite a man. Now, when David, when David's son Absalom rebelled against him, he raised an army, believe it or not, and literally drove his father out of Jerusalem. And his father left across the Kidron Valley and went east. And some of them were cursing him and throwing rocks at him. And they were joining up with Absalom and they hated him. But here's an old man and his name is Barzillai. Look what he did when they were driving David out. 2 Samuel 17, verse 26, It came to pass when David was come to Mahinam, that Shobi, the son of Nahash, of Rabbah, the children of Ammon, and Maker, the son of Amiel, of Lodibar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite of Rogelim, brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kine yes. for David and for the people that were with him to eat. For they said the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Now look at that. That's kindness. Yes, it is. That's kindness. He's showing David kindness. He's showing David he's his friend. You see, a friend in need is a friend indeed, right? Well, that's true. Now, the Bible doesn't say that, but the principle is supported in the Bible, right? David needed a friend. Barzillai showed him he was his friend. Now, look at 2 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 35. It's time now for David to come back. It's time now for David to uh, settle things, and he does. But he deals with Barzillai. David has a good memory. He doesn't forget. Here's an old man. Look what he said of himself. 2 Samuel 19, 35. I am this day four score years old. How old is that? 80. That's 80 years old. That's four years in the future for me. Can you believe that? I looked in the mirror this morning. I thought, good night, man. 80 years old in four years. You'll be 80 in two years. Son, now look at this. <laughs> Take good care of him. <laughs> now watch what he says. I am this day fourscore years old, and can I discern 
between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? He's talking about his physical problems, his aged body. He said, can I hear any more the voice of singing of men and singing of women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my Lord the king? My, 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 what, what a magnanimous spirit he had. It is. He's not thinking of himself. He said, whatever it is that I've ever done for you, David, let's make it better. It's not about me, but it's about what, what, what you can, how you can show your thank, thankfulness and how I can be part of it. I don't want to be the one. And he said, thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king. And why should the king recompense it with me with such a reward? Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again that I may die in mine own city yeah. and be buried by the grave of my father and my mother. Yeah. See that? He was willing to leave David yeah. after he had made himself such a friend to David. Yeah. But he said, look at this now. He's thinking of somebody else. But behold thy servant Chimham. Let him go over with my lord the king and do to him what shall seem good to thee. And the king answered, Chimham shall go over with me and I will do to him what shall seem good unto thee. And whatsoever thou shalt require of me, that will I do for thee. And all the people went over Jordan. And when the king was come over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him. He paid him his respects because this 80-year-old man, 80 years old, did what he could in his limited capacity. Yeah. Here's what one said about him. Although not spared the infirmities of old age, he retained his charm. At 80 years of age, his heart of love was deep and broad. John Trapp says of Barzillai, as he reached an honored age, he had lost his color, but kept his sweet savor with the rose. May grace be ours to grow old gracefully and beautifully. This nation's culture doesn't respect its aged like it should. It doesn't, folks. It doesn't. Now, I'm seven, I'll be 76 years old the 17th of September. I was just taken off of amiodarone. Now, some of you know what that is. Donna Takel knows exactly what it is. She's a heart nurse. Amiodarone is what they call a beta blocker or something like that. But here's, what I, here's why it's important. When I took that medication, my body was so fatigued. When I got up here, I felt like lead in my arms and my body all over. It's just unbelievable at how I felt. I said to myself time and again, I can't continue like this. I am so, so fatigued. Well, I went to see my doctor the other day, my cardiologist, and she changed it from amiodarone to sotalol. And would you believe that I'm tired tonight, but not fatigued? Would you believe that I got my life back? Really? I got my life back. That's why you're seeing me more at night, Sunday night, than was before. I got my life back. I feel like a 53-year-old man now. My daughter's 53. I feel as good as she does. Probably better. But seriously, when you've been where I've been and you come back out of it, you thank God for the goodness of the Lord. Barzillai wanted until the day he died to show grace and mercy to David. Now, folks, we're talking about a man that lived 3,000 years ago. David's time is 1,000 B.C. Yeah. You're looking at the intimate details of a man that lived 3,000 years ago. I pray with all of my heart and all of my soul. I do. God help me tonight. That as however much time he has left for me in this world, that I won't become bitter. I won't become selfish. Yeah. That I won't be self-centered. No. no. That hopefully I'll have more grace more mercy and a little wisdom 
that comes from these years. Don't you think? God has blessed us with older people. You got one sitting right there on the front row. 91, 2, 91 years old, folks. 91 years old. We got people in this church that are 50 that are scared to death they're going to die. <laughs> My. And we have a soul over here, and I'm 75. We'll be 76 in a few days, and she's 91. Just as sweet as they come. That's Barzillai. She's sitting on the front row. That's Barzillai right there. Amen. That's what I want to be. Barzillai is a great man. Yeah, he is. Now, if you go over to the uh, Holy Land and you look across down the Kidron Valley, you'll see some tombs down there. You'll see some tombs. And one of them is kind of like this. And they say it's the tomb of Absalom. Now, whether or not it is, you know, we can't be certain of that, but, but there's a strong tradition that it's the tomb of Absalom. And it's something about how people talk about it when they see it, because I've never had a guide or anybody in any Jewish context at all that had anything good to say about Absalom. Nothing good about him. He was a rebel, yeah. self-centered. He loved himself. But Barzillai, most people have never heard of Barzillai. But you have tonight. You have tonight. Don't forget, you heard about a great man, Barzillai. Is Barzillai in you, my dear friend? As you grow older, as you get older, is that the way you're going to be? Is Barzillai in you? I pray I've got some of him in me. Father, bless your word. Thank you for it tonight. For your goodness, you've been good to me. Got no complaints. Got no complaints. Got none. Bless your name. Thank you, Lord. You've overruled my ignorance and my stupidity and my rebellion time and time and time again. And your gracious, merciful hand has reached down and pulled me through places there's no way I could have gotten through them. Situations I've created out of my stupidity and out of my ignorance, you've redeemed me from them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I remember where I came from, who I am, and I know who my Savior is tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray. I want you to keep your heads bowed for a moment. I'm going to have another prayer. I think we prayer, prayer is a good thing. Yes. May raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me because I, I see myself a lot of these things. I'm in there. Yes, that's me. No question. God bless you here. Well, got hands everywhere. God bless you. Hands back over here. Hands everywhere in here tonight. Father, you saw all the hands. Lord, all I am tonight is the minister, Lord. I'm the preacher, Father. But I am not, I am not, an, I am not between them and you. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And I point all of them to him tonight. He loves them. He'll bless them. He'll draw them to him. And he'll overlook a multitude of failures and still bless them. And he's patient with us to bring forth the fruits of righteousness. Long suffering. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand up tonight. What do we got, brother?